welcome to Data Platform Summit 2022. I'm Edward Pollack, and I'm here to talk about something that has absolutely nothing to do with the Microsoft Data Platform. What am I talking about? Why am I here? Well, it's actually quite relevant to all of us anyway, and that is public speaking. Hugely important thing. It's part of all of our lives. It's an important skill, and we often overlook it because we get heavily involved in tech. So this event's all about the Data Platform, and my other session's all about the Data Platform, but this session is all about something still very important to us and not the data platform, which I think is wonderful. Let's jump right on in. This is me. I've done a lot out in the world of SQL. I've written books. I've spoken at many events, many conferences. I'm a data architect. I do all sorts of optimization, data architecture, uh, analytics, you name it. I I've done a lot. It's fun. I enjoy it. I enjoy sharing it with you. Lots of articles out there. If you find this topic or other ones interesting, feel free to read more or hit me up on Twitter. I'll have all my info here and at the end. <clears throat> the goal here really today is to talk about public speaking, specifically in tech. Why is it important? Why does it matter to us? Uh, why do we care about this? And then a lot of it's going to be spent just tips and tricks to make our lives easier. And I'm, I'm focusing the entire session from the perspective of somebody who has worked in programming, engineering all my life. This is something very familiar to me. I'm used to working with people that we like to call geeks and nerds and things like that. And I say it affectionately. These are people I love working with. I enjoy people who are detail-oriented and think of tech and talk about it all the time. I love that. And you probably love that, too. So this is really a session aimed at you. This isn't speaking for sales or marketing. This is, sales. Uh, this is public speaking for us. So a lot of this is going to be just, what can we do to be better? How do we improve? And we're all improving. That's a very important piece of this, too. To start this out, really, what is public speaking? And very often when we think of it, we simply think about, oh, it's just you go to an event, you speak in front of a bunch of people at a conference, just like this, right? And that's a little piece of what public speaking is, but that's not all of what it is. There's much more to it. It's really any time you speak in front of anybody. It could be in an interview for a job. It could be at a meeting at work. It could be amongst your friends. It's part of your life. Whenever you open up your mouth and talk to other people, you're speaking, and it's often going to be in public, and it's often going to be for a reason. You're not just talking for no reason. You want to sell something, convince people of something, share something, and you want it to be meaningful. And the better you are at it, the better you'll be at that communication. You could have the best idea on planet Earth, but if you don't know how to communicate it effectively, that idea is just going to stay lodged in your head and die with you one day. And so the goal of communication is to take all of our thoughts, our ideas, all the wonderful things boiling around inside of our head, and make great use of it. And that's what this is really all about. Uh, communication is centered on this. If you can't talk to people, it's hard to communicate. And as a bonus, when you get better at public speaking, you find that you get better at writing. You get better at other forms of communication as well. Your code comes out a little bit better. Your comments, your documentation come out a little better because as you get better in one area of communication, others naturally follow along with you. And this is a long journey over the course of your career. This is not something that starts and ends. This is something you will improve in forever. And we're all good at some aspects of this and bad at others. I know what I'm good at. I know I'm bad at many things too, and we all are. No one's a perfect speaker. You can watch the best speakers in the world, the most experienced politicians, and they'll still make gaffes, they'll make mistakes, we'll laugh at them, we'll get a chuckle because that just happens part of life. And those are the things we roll with as part of this. Tech's a little different, though. We're not speaking at an event about sales. We're not trying to, you know, go out and motivate people. This is a little different. Maybe we are trying to motivate people as part of what we do. But in tech, we're really often trying to teach people things. That's most of what we're doing in the sessions we present is we're teaching something. We're sharing knowledge. And that puts us in kind of a dual role. We are a teacher, which is not an easy job, and we're also a subject matter expert. We're the person people are looking up to to say, you know a lot about this. Teach me. Teach me about optimization or data factory or column store indexes or synapse or whatever. You're teaching something, and your goal is to get that information across as best as possible. Your audience being heavily technical, either because they're developers or database people, or maybe they just work in tech, they're involved in quality assurance, or they're managers or directors in tech. They're all detail-oriented, they're all used to this, they know the kinds of things you do, and they know what they do. So expect them to be nitpicking bits and pieces of what you do. No one's just looking to be motivated, they want to know the details and they'll question you on it if they think you're wrong. And another key to this is, this world is vast. The world of data is vast, the world of SQL Server is vast, the world of even just single features in SQL Server is vast. Therefore, 
we can be experts in some of the stuff. We can't be the best at everything. We just can't be. I know people are the best in the field, the best in the world at certain things, and there are other areas just right over here they know nothing about, or next to nothing about. <clears throat> I know people who can say, oh yeah, I can make any query go as fast as possible, but uh, SQL Server Reporting Services, what does that stand for again? What does it do? So everyone's good at some things and not good at others, and it's important to recognize that, because you will get hit with questions and thoughts and ideas that you don't know a lot about necessarily. It's going to happen. Guaranteed. Therefore, details are good. We want some. We want to include enough information to make us have a meaningful conversation with our audience, but not too much, because too many details will bore the heck out of everybody. People aren't here to get every single nuance of everything. They want to learn something and not be bored to death. And it's a little tougher in a virtual environment, but in person, we typically know more boring the heck out of people, and we don't want to do that. I want to break up what we're doing here today into really two areas of just presentation in general and speaking, and that's presentation and facilitation. I'm going to break it into these two areas because they have different purposes. Presentation is really just speaking itself. It's, just, it's talking, it's describing things, it's explaining things. It's really just the actual act of just talking. Are you loud? Are you soft? Are you fast? Are you slow? Do you enunciate well? Or do you mumble? Things like that. That's presentation, and it's an important skill. Learning how to speak clearly and effectively is a very useful skill to have, and it takes a long time to develop. The other side of public speaking, though, isn't just that. We've all been in and on presentations or lectures where the person could speak pretty well, but they had nothing else to it, and you eventually get bored. <clears throat> Facilitation is how you connect with your audience, how you talk with them, how you answer que you know, questions, how you ask them about their lives, you poll them, and you in, other, in different ways just kind of get a little closer to them, get them a little closer to you. So your session is more than just you talking for 60 minutes, it's you interacting with an audience, them getting to know a little bit more about you and your life and who you are and the funny jokes and things, because data jokes are funny and we all have many of them, we have great stories. So share these things. They, they help your presentation, they make them better, they make it more interesting, and they'll keep everybody engaged more. If you're boring, if you don't really connect with anybody, if you drone on and on, people will disconnect and forget you, whether they're in person and fall asleep, or whether they're online and, you know, they just kind of click over to the window and begin doing other things. A good presentation will always have both of these aspects, presentation skills, facilitation skills. We want both. They're very important. This is really what we built up to. This is a very simple definition of what is public speaking and what are we here for. The rest of the session is all really just how can we get better at what we do? How do we go from being scared to heck of ever speaking in public ever to feeling a little more comfortable about it? And, and no one's ever always comfortable. There are still times I, I present sessions and I'm nervous because it's something new. I haven't done it before. It's a new audience. It's a bigger session. It's more advanced. I don't know. And, and that's what happens. And so those feelings don't really ever go away. It's part of life. But you'll find the more you do this, uh, the more it just kind of sinks in and the more you find that you just dive right in and do your thing. And the next thing you know it, an hour has passed and you're done. There's certain keys to always have whenever you're giving a presentation about anything, whether it's a formal presentation or an informal one. The informal is very important. Not every time you present in life is going to be a big formal get up in front of people and hit play. It's very often going to be informal. Many of the things that occur in, in our working worlds are informal. You have to chat with the boss about something, negotiate a salary, tell them why you have a great idea for some new feature in your software that no one's ever thought of before, but how are you going to sell it? It's going to cost some money. Is it worth the money? How do you sell them on it? This is all part of what it is, and it's very often more informal than formal. But regardless of what you're going to do, regardless of whether it's a big session in front of a thousand people, or whether it's a little talk with three people, always have goals. Goals are important, and you don't have to have them be written down in a slide like this. You don't need that necessarily. But you do want to have goals. Why are you speaking in the first place? Why are you here? What's the point of all this? It's very important to have, and don't have too many goals. You don't need 20 goals. Just two or three is fine. I want to introduce public speaking, describe some tips for making it better, give a demo, and then wrap up and take Q&A. That could be your goals. It's also your agenda often. So goals and agenda go together. Your goals are what's your purpose here? What are you trying to teach? And your agenda is how you get to those goals. What are the step-by-steps that you want to go through in general to get from start to finish? 
And that basically builds you up to a nice plot here. You now have a symphony. You have an introduction, you have a whole bunch of content in the middle, you have some things that repeat, you have an ending. And that natural progression is important. Uh, whenever you're presenting anything, the last thing you want is to get stuck and trapped and you know locked into Q&A that you're all going over on, or taking one topic and beating it to death and you have more important things to do. And so just having a general idea of what it is you want to accomplish and why, and then how to do it, will really get you in a nice position to do what you need to do. And if you happen to go off the rails at all, it'll get you back. You'll say, oh yeah, I want to do this next, and you'll do the next thing next and move on. Q&A is very important, and not all presentation formats allow for interactive Q&A. Many do, but not all. You don't need to have, though, formal Q&A. Q&A can be something you take on social media ahead of time, or afterwards. It can be something done through a chat window in a virtual presentation, or it can be done in person by people raising their hands. So, lots and lots of possibilities here for how to do Q&A. And that's great. What else? At the end, it's good to have some sort of formal wrap-up. You don't have to make it fancy. It doesn't have to be a big conclusion slide that goes on for 20 minutes, but you do want to have some formal Q&A. Just some opportunity to kind of wrap things up and give it to a natural close. It could be 30 seconds, a minute. Not a big deal, but it's good to have something. This is kind of your natural progression here. You have goals that lead you to an agenda of what you want to do. That brings you from start to finish through the ability to have some questions and answers and wrap up. And the Q&A is important because it provides a good facilitation opportunity between you and your audience, regardless of what your format is. And again, many presentations today are virtual, many are in person, many of your meetings are virtual, many are in person. It'll be a little different in each scenario. It'll feel different, it'll look different, but these same elements exist regardless. And each opportunity to facilitate and talk to people and connect with them, even just a few people, if you have a thousand people and you connect with five of them closely, that's a good thing. A lot of this is building comfort. The, the facilitation, the Q&A, the chatting, the humor, the, the chuckling, the mistakes you've made before. Uh, I've seen presentations where I've hit record, but they were actually already recording and it turned it off and they went on for an hour and then realized they weren't recording. Whoops! Uh, I personally was at an event in New York City years ago where I got my session going and my laptop died five minutes in and I'm just like, well, this is an opportunity for a lot of humor. It does stink that my laptop died. I can't show the slides or whatever, but it was funny. And it was a great story, and people still chat about it and laugh about it because, you know, it was memorable, and I just kept rolling with it and having fun, and it ended up being hilarious as opposed to too embarrassing. You know, the laptop's the laptop. It isn't me. I'm not a laptop. So if it breaks, I'm not broken. It's just a piece of technology. That's, that happens, right? We all, we all deal with that. So one thing you can do to build comfort in a session, feel better, be comfier, do better, keep a nice pace, and so on, is just chat before the session starts. Almost all sessions will have some opportunity, whether formal or informal, just chat with your moderators, chat with the attendees, just ask some questions, throw things out there like, hey, how many people here are developers? How many people are data professionals? How many are others? Any QA, designers, architects, who's here? You know, oh, uh, anybody have a good joke? Anybody uh, saw the new update that came out recently that broke something? You know, just little things like that are a great way to just kind of get people involved, chat, have fun. Do you see that new feature of the Is Not Distinct that came to 2022 just now in the recent update? Just little things like that can kind of get people engaged. They'll chat. They'll say, oh, yeah, I've heard of that. I haven't heard of that. I don't know what you're talking about. And that'll give you the opportunity to kind of like almost pregame your whole session. So when you begin talking for real, the attendees already know you a bit. They've gotten into it a bit. They heard about you or your kids or your family or friends or some place you love, whatever. You went to the Grand Canyon last week. You want to talk about it. I don't know. There's infinite multitude of things you can just talk about, <clears throat> and they can just be fun. And one important thing about this, and, and there's, there's some, you know, a lot of do's, there's a lot of don'ts, too. You know, We're going to take time to learn about our audience. They want to learn about us. Who are we? What do we do? But also, there's things we shouldn't do. We're trying to build comfort, not build discomfort. And there's a lot of things we inadvertently can do, either due to habit or just we've seen done elsewhere, that we think may be good, and it may not be. A big one I see in tech a lot is people quiz attendees. They say, hey, who here knows this? You. Do you know the answer to this? Do you know what the right T-SQL syntax is for merge? And they're going to either say, yes, I'm a smarty pants, or they're going to be embarrassed. And more often than not, people will be embarrassed or put in the spot or made to be uncomfortable. Even if they know the answer, maybe they didn't really want to be called on. And so generally, just quizzing people isn't very... Unless you're in a quiz bowl or something, and this is Jeopardy, you don't really want to quiz your attendees. It makes them feel weird and awkward, and 
you know, you have a one percent chance of them enjoying it, and ninety nine percent chance of them being kind of felt to made awkward. Um, don't insult people, don't judge them, don't embarrass them, don't make them feel weird, and this should be obvious, but it's amazing how often in a session and people just make weird jokes. They pick on somebody for their hair or something, or their clothes, or their gender, or something stupid. It's like, don't go there. Don't do it. Don't waste your time. It's not worth it. You may think you're being funny, and maybe it seems okay to you, but it's probably not. And if you see yourself going down a bad path of jokes or something embarrassing or weird, you can back off any time. Just back off, say, oops, sorry, won't do it again, done. Um, avoid controversial stuff, unless your session's actually about politics uh, or whatever. Don't talk about it. It's not worth it. Half the audience is going to agree with you, half's going to hate you. And unless you want that, uh, it's probably worth avoiding. Just and These are things that sound like you should never do them, and you probably shouldn't. There's very little good that comes out of sticking it to your audience. It's just not worth it. <clears throat> Sharing information about yourself is great. It's wonderful. People learn about you. Like, hey, I'm Ed Pollock. I'm from Albany, New York. I have a family of four. I have two kids, three and six, and they're currently not here. If you listen carefully, you can tell they're not here right now, or else you'd be hearing, like, paint coming off the ceiling and stuff. Just things like that. I love spicy food. I like baking things. Now you know a little bit about me. That's fun. Share information, but don't go too far. This is not a session about you. It's very often a session. It's not a biography. It's a session about a topic. If you're supposed to be here talking about Azure Synapse, talk about Azure Synapse. Don't spend an hour talking about you and all the things you've done because some people may care. Um, most people just won't. That's just how it is. Don't overdo it. <clears throat> if you really need comfort, it's your first big session, or you're really just not sure about yourself and you want a crutch, this sounds like you're cheating, but you can have a friend or family member just sit in. And that's totally legit. There's nothing wrong with that. Just have a friend, a coworker, somebody you know, sit in the session. Just sit in there. They can ask a question. And honestly, it sounds like you're cheating. It's fine. You really can't go wrong here. It's a nice thing. Having somebody there who you know will make you comfortable. And it's a really nice thing. So just, if you <clears throat> want an extra crutch, haven't presented a whole lot, you're nervous, have somebody you know in the session. Uh, it's a great way to build comfort. It's easy. And... No one's going to know unless you want to have fun with it. You can joke and be like, hey, my coworkers over there listening in. They're going to give me a hard time, aren't they? It's just fun. Enjoy it. Roll with it. It's a good time. Content's important. And depending on your format, virtual or in person, you may have a lot more of one thing and a lot less of the other. Uh, in general, your PowerPoint's probably going to be a big piece of your presentation in many formats, especially virtual. Because if you're virtual, people are only going to be seeing you and your screen and maybe some demos. <clears throat> That's what they're going to see. You can roll without PowerPoint if you want. If you want to do it that way, you don't have to, but then you'll hit a download later. Uh, an important piece is you may have stuff to share with the audience. You may have some SQL files, some demos, some PowerShell, your PowerPoint, whatever. Uh, whatever it is, you may want to share it. So one of the benefits of having a PowerPoint is you can share it. But whatever you do, don't put every single word and read off your PowerPoint. It's going to be awkward. You can kind of go bullet by bullet if you're nervous. But don't read off the slides. That's just weird. You can do it. It'll be weird, though. And people will begin to think, do I really need to see you here? Because I could read your slides. If you're going to share your information, tell everybody immediately when you have an opportunity. If you don't do it, like here, people will begin asking the moderator, hey, is this going to be shared? Is this going to be up later on? Can I download this? Should I write it all down? And the answer, do a code or demos. The answer is yes, I will share it with you later. It'll be up on OneDrive, it'll be on Dropbox, it'll be somewhere, it'll be on GitLab, whatever. It'll be somewhere if you download later. So the slides are references, the demos are references, all these things are wonderful things, and you can then use them after the event's over. Send them over to people, tell them to look through it, and they can ask you questions. <clears throat> so your content should be varied, and you don't want to really focus on any one thing too much. Whenever you feel like you need something else, whenever you feel like you're reading too much, droning on too much, um, make it funny. Have have a good time. Make it enjoyable. Uh, everyone's going to make a mistake. I've misspelled things in slides before. I've checked them like four times, and I've misspelled things. And I've gotten to words and be like, oh, I spelled the word entertainment wrong. It's entertainment. And people laugh at it. And you're like, okay, I'll reference this for the rest of my session because it's funny. Well, I'll be entertained because I spelled the word wrong. I did spell it right here, by the way. But if I spelled it wrong, it would have been funny, and I could have made a point of it. And it would have almost seemed like I hadn't made a mistake, which you can do that, too. There's a lot of things that we do in the world of presentation that are hard, that are complicated, that are 
habits. Habits are hard to break, and we do them a lot. And getting rid of them, fixing them, doing them less takes practice and a little bit of patience, too. One of the biggies is filler words. We hear this all the time. People are presenting and say, um, a lot. Um, for the next session, um, or so yeah, like, so yeah, that's it. So yeah, here's my information. And people don't even realize they're doing it all the time. It's almost natural. But if you find you're repeating words over and over, the easiest way to break it is just to take a little pause. Instead of trying to fill in all the gaps, just take a pause, breathe, and keep going. <clears throat> you can extend previous words, ideas, or just stop for a sec, put a comma in there, or a period. Colloquialisms are very similar. We have all of our words that we just use over and over, and the challenge there is they make us sound silly. We're not trying to sound silly, but if you use the word like 150 times, you're going to sound a little silly. It's not intentional, but it's what's going to happen. Colloquialisms are also weird because they're not necessarily words we repeat over and over, but they distract. If I say, let's face it, we know speaking is hard. Let's face it, we should have good body language. Let's face it, we're going to practice a lot. But after the third or fourth time I say that, you're going to begin saying, hey, Ed's the let's face it guy. He's, he says it over and over, he's silly. And like that becomes part of what you're doing. I just said the word like, by the way, I caught that. But say it over and over and sound silly. So the goal here is to not sound awkward to the best of our ability. These words can be said occasionally, no one's going to care. If you repeat things, we begin to be noticeable in that regard. Words, phrases, things you repeat, using the same word over and over will get noticed. This is a chance to use a thesaurus. You know, think of other words to say something besides the same word. And this will help your other abilities in communication, too. If you're writing a, a book or an article or a thesis or really anything, and use the same word over and over, people will notice it and say, word choice. You need better word choice there. Don't just use the word great over and over. Use the word stupendous or effective or optimal or something else. And it may make better sense out of what it is you're trying to say. These are really hard habits to break. They could take years. They could take forever. You may never fully break them. But they're things if you work on them, you'll feel better. And when you watch your presentations later, because yes, we probably should watch our presentations later, even though it's painful, you'll feel better about what you see. Body language is another part of this too, and depending whether you're virtual and staring at a camera like this, or you're in front of people in an audience and you're in a room and there's lots of space to walk around, body language helps. It really accentuates what it is you're saying and doing. It, can, it should really be natural. You, sh you don't, may want to go out of your way to do things in the beginning, but as you do it more, you'll find that it just comes naturally. Your hands are going to move around, you're going to walk around a bit. It's all going to kind of make sense and feel easy and not be awkward. If you're in person, stand up tall. If you're in a chair, try to step up the camera and, and sit tall. Don't slouch. Don't look down. Don't look at the bottom of the screen. Your camera is here. This takes practice. Look at the camera. Not especially during demos when you're looking at code over here. Try to focus on the camera. If you're in person, focus on the audience. And this is also an opportunity to connect with people. You don't have to focus your eyes on one piece of the audience. You can focus on different people. If you're in a room of 20 people, you can talk and kind of make eye contact with each person there over time, and they'll look at you. This isn't creepy or anything. This is just you're looking at people and showing them that you're there, you're with them, you're talking to them, you're not just staring off in the space. Again, this all takes practice, but as you do it more, you'll find that you connect better with people, and you look like you're doing a better job of things, you're communicating a little more effectively because I can accentuate, enunciate, put focus on things, or not. <clears throat> I can be loud and noticeable, or I can be quieter and less so. If you're in person, or even in virtual, don't lean on things. If you're leaning, if you're slouching, if you're like this, it's going to look kind of silly. And you won't do it on purpose, but you may do it by habit. And if that's the case, just kind of notice it and fix it, and people won't really care that much. <clears throat> in a lot of virtual sessions, you'll have a presentation, and then the corner is you. And because you're over in the corner, it may almost be weird. Like, I'm over here staring forwards in a video, but my presentation is up here. Uh, or maybe up here, or down there, or down there. We'll see how I cut and paste this all in later. Who knows? But <clears throat> because of that, uh, it's not really a huge deal. But try to look at the camera, look at people. That works really nicely. Demos are a big deal. Depending on your presentation format, pretending, uh, depending on the kind of event you're at, you may or may not have demos. <clears throat> Demos can be wonderful for some kinds of tech presentations because they're a chance to really show how something works. They're wonderful. Like, hey, I talked about 
you know, data factory for five minutes, ten minutes, thirty minutes. Here it is. Here's how you do it. Connecting right now. I'm going to show it to you. Huge. It could be a great way to do it. Uh, they can also go wrong. The more live demos you have, the more they can go wrong. And this isn't necessarily bad. It's just a risk of what you're doing. So the most important thing to do with your demos is practice them. Practice them the day of your presentation, as soon as you can before your presentation, because things change. Updates get run. Your Windows updates. Your management studio gets updated. Your SQL Server gets updated. Something gets updated somewhere. Maybe your Dropbox disconnects or something. You don't have all the updates that you put in to your presentation from yesterday. And that can be embarrassing. Hey, I'm going to my presentation, and why is my demo only half done? I thought I had 10 pages of SQL. I only have three pages. If you check it ahead of time, you'll be sure that everything is synced, it's all there, it's correct, it's all in one piece. It all runs correctly. Maybe you wrote it on one server and then presented it in a different server. <clears throat> but whatever the, the setup is, practice it not long before your presentation. Because you practice it a month before, something's going to change, and it's going to be a problem. Always have a backup plan for demos. Always. And the backup plan can really be for things that will go wrong eventually. You may not think they're going to go wrong, but they will. Maybe the Wi-Fi is down, maybe AWS is down, maybe Azure is down, maybe Dropbox is down, you can't get to your files for some reason because you didn't sync them to your computer. Who knows? There's many things that can go wrong that you're not anticipating. Maybe your laptop dies, maybe your battery isn't charging correctly, maybe your PowerPoint keeps crashing for no reason at all, we don't know why. <clears throat> Stuff happens. Lots of ways to do it, lots of ways to fix it. Uh, one way to handle demos that it, it sounds corny and stupid, but is not at all, is can them. You can have a can demo, either as your primary demo or as a backup in case things don't go well. A can demo is basically you just snapshot your screen for everything you want to show in Management Studio, in SSRS, in SSI, you know, anywhere, whatever you want to do it in, <clears throat> and paste it on in and show it in PowerPoint. So you're clicking through your slides and they're seeing the demo progress. They see all the content they would get if you were doing a live demo, for the most part, minus you doing stuff, and it's in your PowerPoint. That's one way to can a demo in the event that things go wrong. It's a great backup plan. It takes a little bit of time and effort, but not that much. You're running your demo anyway, so how much more effort is just to screenshot it and paste it in? It's a great way to just deal with the fact that things can go wrong, and it's especially useful for high-risk demos. To me, a high-risk demo are things that are in the cloud, things that require internet connections. And as soon as you go down that road, the chance of failure goes from like 1% to a higher percent. And if you present a lot, you'll eventually hit those kinds of failures. If things go wrong, and eventually, if you present enough, they will. Try to troubleshoot it for a brief period of time. By brief, I mean like 5, 10, 15 seconds, no more than that, and then move on. You don't want to sit in front of your demo trying to fix it for minutes or longer. People will lose interest fast. They will think you failed, and they will just get distracted and stay distracted for the rest of your session. I have personally seen sessions where the presenter had an issue with the demo and sat there troubleshooting it for 10 or 20 minutes. Don't do that. It's not a big deal. If your demo fails and five seconds, ten seconds pass and you suddenly realize, you know, I'm not sure I can fix it. Just move on. It's happened to me many times. It's happened to other people many times. The best of us have had it happen. It's fine. If it fails, just shrug, say, hey, if this were to succeed, here's what would have happened, here's what you would have seen, and move on. It's not a big deal. Even if a lot of demos fail, you can talk about them anyway. It's not the end of the world. It will be a little awkward. You'll feel sad. But... The audience won't be sad. If they still learn all the things they were supposed to learn from your demos, then you still succeeded in your goals. You had goals up front. Remember goals? Our goals were like, I want to teach certain subjects. I want to share certain information. I want to introduce some new features of SQL Server 2022 or something like that. You can do that and still do it effectively even if demos go wrong. Therefore, stick to your goals whenever you're at doubt of what you should be doing or how you feel or maybe you made a mistake. Just think about your goals, what you want to accomplish, think about your agenda, each little bullet point that gets you to your goals, and simply follow them down the line and keep going. You still describe all the things that would have happened, and that's okay. <clears throat> so if your demos fail, just move on. If you can fix it, and you know you can fix it in like five seconds or ten seconds, do it. Or if the fixing of a demo is a great learning mechanism, you can do that too. But don't let the failure become the center of your whole presentation, because it will be painful painful for you, painful for the audience. Five, ten minutes will become hours and days of pain that you'll suffer. It's not worth it for you or for your audience. When in doubt, move on. No big deal. And it really is no big deal. Nobody will ever remember a failed demo that you troubleshot for ten seconds and moved on. 
If you spend five minutes on it, they'll remember. They'll think of you, and it'll go on your feedback forms, but it'll never be remembered much if it's only a few seconds. <clears throat> For example, this is my only demo here, by the way. Here it is. Let's say I'm doing a presentation on column store indexes, and I want to present to everybody some metadata from SQL Server. I wrote a big, long, honking ass query about some metadata about segments. That's all. I want to show some segment metadata. I got my query. I run it. And nothing comes back. One of two things will happen here. Either I'm going to say, I don't know what's wrong. Hey, everybody. Something's wrong here. I mistyped something. Oops. What you would have seen is the metadata for all 24 of these segments for this column, one for each row group done. If you describe it and go through it and say, here's what I would have seen. Here's the columns that are on the screen that aren't populated, but I can tell you what they are. I see a table name, index name, column name, and so on. And you can describe it. And that's good. The row count's there. Wow, the min and max meta IDs are there. I can use it to determine metadata about my information here. Or, if I think I can fix it, like, hey, I know exactly what's wrong. I, I forgot a letter here. Whoops. There's the data. Awesome. There we go. All the early point, the point here is fix it quickly or move on. Don't get stuck in the middle. It's painful. The demo here is irrelevant. I'll include it with the information that's shared after this is over. But it's really not a very relevant piece of information. It's really just a, how do you react to failure? And the answer is, don't fail more. Turn failure into success and keep going. Not a big deal then. <clears throat> Q&A is a biggie. Q&A is something where it's both very, very useful because you're going to interact with the audience. This is a great chance to facilitate, a great chance to connect with the audience some more, build some comfort with people in the audience, talk to them, learn from them, have them learn from you. But you're also giving up some control. You're giving up control of your session to people asking questions. Those questions may be easy. They may be hard. They could be off-the-rail stuff that you could never possibly answer. You could have a heckler. doesn't happen much, but you could. So what do you do? Number one rule of Q&A is never lie, never make it up, never fake it. If you're 100% sure of an answer, give it. If you're not 100% sure, you can try to answer if you want, but be honest and upfront that you're not totally certain Regardless, though, if you're not 100% certain of an answer, tell the audience. I will verify it later. I will look it up later. I will post it on Twitter later. I will respond to you later in the chat. Whatever it is, either be 100% correct and confident or punt it for later. And don't feel bad about it. There's nothing at all wrong about punting the answer till later and answering it later afterwards. There's nothing. No one's going to hold it against you. No one expects you to be a robot that can answer every question live, right in front of people, without a hesitation. If that happens... No problem. People will ask you questions you can't answer. Like, hey, uh, for replication, I just want to know in 2019 which columns data types are not valid if I'm going to be doing replication of it. And if they go down that road, there's too much detail and you can't answer it, you can table it. Is it going to be a very, very long, complicated answer if they ask you a one-minute question? Is it off-topic? Is it weird? Is it personal? Does it not belong here? Just punt it for later. No one's going to mind. <clears throat> that punt can go to chat, it can go to social media, it can go to a blog, it can go anywhere. It can go anywhere, it's not a big deal where it goes as long as it goes somewhere. Then you can take your time afterwards, research the answer, check the docs, and be certain you have the most accurate information. You can even quote the docs if you want. Like, hey, here's the link to MSDM with all the details that I don't feel like copying. Here it is, the source of truth. That's wonderful. That will build confidence, it'll make your audience happy, they'll appreciate you took the time to give them the right answer, and you didn't fake it. Faking it is terrible. If you fake it and are wrong, people will hold that against you for the rest of your session. And in the future, they'll say, hey, do I want to go to a session by Ed Pollock? Ah, he made up some garbage last time. Nah, I'll skip it. He doesn't know what he's talking about. It doesn't take much for that to happen. So better not try to fake it. Just move on. Answer what you can. No biggie otherwise. I punt questions all the time. I don't feel bad about it. They can be deferred to later. No biggie. If you get a heckler or a know-it-all, this will happen eventually. If you get somebody in the audience who clearly is trying to do some grandstanding, show how smart they are, show you how you're wrong or whatever, just move on. Be nice. Don't be mean. Don't be a jerk. Don't be a heckler back at them. You won't win that fight. This is your session. You're in charge. Don't give it over to them. Simply be polite, table them, tell them you'll chat with them later, and move on. One important caveat to that is if somebody really is harassing you, which should never happen, but if you do truly have somebody in your session who's giving you a very hard time, you're uncomfortable, get a moderator to get rid of them. There's no question about that. There should never be harassment. You should never be uncomfortable. 
they're a heckler, push them off to later, and they will get it. If they're truly ruining your session and ruining your life, get rid of them. Dump them from the session, get a moderator, remove them, done. That should never happen. This is really important. Q&A is a great chance to connect with people. It's a great chance to explain things you didn't explain well previously, or to describe things you didn't get to or didn't go into detail about, or maybe something unrelated to your session, or they just want to understand anything. Like, hey, this happened to me once. What would you do? This is a great chance to connect and talk. So don't pass the opportunity to do Q&A, whether it's part of your session or you do it later. Whenever you do it, it's a wonderful, wonderful feature of presentation, Q&A. Do it, make it count, and don't be afraid to let it drag out later on. It doesn't need to be part of your session. Uh, and drag out the wrong way to put it. But <clears throat> you can answer questions in Twitter afterwards. You can answer lots of questions. Your session may be only 60 minutes, but you could have endless Q&A afterwards in the chat, on social media, in a blog somewhere. That allows you to extend your session. Your one hour session now becomes an, an hour and a half session. People look at your demos and say, hey, this code here, why is it written this way? And you can say, hey, that's the most optimal way to write it. Or, hey, that was written for 2016, but I can do better now. And now your sessions become bigger and better, all by virtue of just Q&A. A real key with all this is practice is very important. Whatever it is you're doing, there's no way to get better without practice. This is not something you get naturally. There are people you see who may seem like amazing speakers. Like they do this every day, all the time, and they're perfect. Nobody's perfect. Nobody. If you watch them enough, they'll make a mistake. If you watch them enough, I'll make a mistake. You'll make a mistake. We're all going to make mistakes. And the only way to get better is to do this over and over and over and identify what do I do well, what do I not do well. One of the easiest ways to do that is watch other speakers. This is risk free. Just attend a presentation. Watch the speaker and look at what they do and how they do it. And identify what do you like about them or what do you think isn't very good and then apply that to your own presentation. They said the word like 143 times. I don't want to do that. They pace back and forth really fast and never look at the audience. Well, that's weird. I don't want to do that either. Or they had really good eye contact the whole time and it was beautiful and I felt wanted. I liked it. Well, that's good too. Think of all those things. This is a risk-free thing. You can just attend presentations virtual, in-person, whatever. And by doing that, you'll learn by watching others. And it's, it's risk-free. Nothing can go wrong. <clears throat> Another thing that can't go wrong, but is definitely harder, is record yourself and watch your own presentation. This is not easy. We all look at our own presentations and want to vomit a little bit in our mouths because it really is difficult. Seeing yourself speak is very different than listening to yourself while you're speaking. I'm here talking right now and I hear my voice, I see my screen, I have a million distractions all around me, and it feels like one thing. When I watch myself on YouTube later, it's going to seem awkward. My voice sounds different. Do I really sound like that? Oh, God. Do I look that way? Do I make that face? Oh, I'm yucky. That's just natural. You should still do it, though. Watch yourself present and look for little things you can improve on. Ignore the things that are just natural to you because you're going to find things that are wrong that aren't really wrong. Look for big problems and fix them. If you're saying the same words over and over, notice that and try to correct it. If you missed an important point that you really should have had in there, a whole demo got skipped by accident, don't forget it. Maybe put a note in there. Notes to yourself are okay, especially when you're presenting a session for the first time. You have a brand new session that has never been done before. Put footnotes and clues in there. For example, if you have a demo, you don't have to remember the demo is there. You can put a slide in there. It says demo. Here's my demo. Or a little note in the bottom of the slide saying, my demo is happening now. And then within the demos, you could have additional notes and comments that remind you of, hey, be sure to turn on statistics IO and the execution plan so everyone can see your performance. Those are little things you can do. There's nothing against the rules and having notes to yourself. And if you put notes in there, your life will be better. It'll be easier, and no one's going to think bad of it. No one's going to think you're being lazy or cutting corners. We're all going to think, oh, they're organized. Wow, that's really wonderful. They're so organized. You should, you should be organized. Organized is good. So don't be afraid to put crutches and notes and details and hints to yourself. You can put hints in your queries. You can put hints in your presentation. It's the same thing. Don't be afraid to do that. It's very helpful. <clears throat> if you have a presentation you want to give, whether it's an interview or a formal presentation or some pitch for something at work, whatever it is, don't be afraid to first give it to a smaller group. Find a friend you know and trust who you think will give you good feedback, honest feedback. 
buy them dinner and say, hey, I'm bribing you with food. Can you give me honest feedback on this presentation for the next 30 minutes? Thank you. Or colleagues, or groups of people you know and trust. If you have a big presentation to give in two months at a conference, and you can give it ahead of time at a user group meeting, do that. Better yet, schedule for the user group meeting first before you put it to put it in a big conference. But regardless, this is your chance to give a trial run, get honest feedback in a lower risk environment where you feel more comfortable before going to a bigger, more nerve wracking environment and have to do it for real. They're all for real, but the smaller the group, the more friendly it is, the easier it is. I know that if I present to my user group personally, I'm 100% at ease. If I make a mistake, we're all going to laugh. Nothing's going to go wrong. It's not being recorded usually. It's just chill. I know that. And therefore, if I give it there first and give it somewhere else later, it's going to be very comfortable and easy. <clears throat> if I don't do that, I might be more nervous. I might miss things, make mistakes. So always present an important session at least once before you give it for real. And try to give it in front of people that will give you good feedback. You're always going to have people in your audience who give you a 1 or a 5 or a 10 or whatever with no feedback. No text, no detail, nothing. You should encourage it, though. If a presentation has feedback that's allowed, ask for feedback. Learn about yourself. What did I do right? What did I do wrong? That's important. Learn. Timing's hard. We all have different ways to present. I know, me personally, I'm a very fast presenter. I love presenting fast. I love lightning talks. I love advanced presentations. I love going on and on and on. I try to slow down, though, here and there to emphasize points and not simply be rushing the whole time, though. That's my style. Some people present very slowly. Some present very fast. You're only really going to know what you're comfortable with and what's right or wrong by watching yourself and listening to feedback. And take feedback honestly. This is a big, Feedback's hard. You'll feel sometimes that feedback is an affront to you. It's offensive. It's people are criticizing me and beating me down. That's not what feedback is. Feedback should be seen as constructive. Even when people don't communicate it constructively, take it honestly. <clears throat> if you get 20 pieces of feedback and half of them say you are too fast or too slow, or too loud or too soft, or you made a mistake, and they all say the same thing, you should improve it. If there's one comment that says something, think about it a little. If you contradictory comments, maybe no big deal. Maybe it is. But think about it, though, and take feedback to heart. It's very important. Pace is very, very hard. It's like running. If you've ever been a runner before, you know that running a long race, a 10, 20 mile race, a marathon, is a skill. And the skill is not just much conditioning yourself to be able to run that far, which is very hard. But how do you pace yourself so you start and finish at the same basic pace and don't kill yourself in the beginning, go too easy, kill yourself at the end, whatever. <clears throat> it's a marathon. Speaking really is seen as a marathon. And whatever your pace is, try to maintain a constant pace for the whole time. It's not easy. It's very, very hard. And by watching yourself and getting feedback, you can learn what happens. This brings us to mistakes. We will all make mistakes. Some will come into your feedback. You'll say something offended somebody, and they're going to put in your feedback. You made a religious joke. I didn't appreciate it. They'll say that. Just don't do it again. And if you know who the person is, you can apologize. That's a huge one up there. If you make a true mistake, it's embarrassing enough that you feel like you should apologize, just do it. People will think you're kind of cool for doing that and taking the time to own up to it. And that will mend whatever the thing was you did. <clears throat> if it's more of a minor mistake, like you talk too fast, if you were too soft, if you, you know, accidentally had your, your video skewed to one side or something, your camera's like this, whatever. Easy to fix, easy to laugh at. Some presenters will actually blog post after all the presentations saying, here's how it went. Here's what went well, here's what went poorly. Hey, everybody, read it and tell me what you think. This is very honest, very transparent, and people might like this. So there's many, many ways you, you can improve and many, many ways you can kind of smooth over the mistakes you make and make them less of a big deal. People may put in your feedback that you did something wrong, but if you admit to it, and then next time you don't do it again, that's pretty impressive. Not everyone does that. Not everybody fixes their mistakes. Uh, but if you do, you'll be better off. If it's any point in your presentation at all where you don't really know what to do, you're at an awkward moment, you made a mistake, you're going too fast, you're just rambling on, you're not sure what to do, pause. If you've got a water nearby, take a swig of water. Think for a second, laugh, tell a story. Just take a moment to take a break. There's nothing wrong with a break. If you see yourself going so deep into your content and you're running late and you're behind and 
You'll never possibly make it through all your content in time. Just skip some stuff. It's better to take a break, slow down, relax, deep breath, than it is to charge in and go too fast and blow it out of the water. We don't want to do that. <clears throat> so the ideal scenario here is really going to be how do you pace yourself nicely and smooth up the mistakes? If you goof, a rock and a goof, how do you simply take a break and move on and let it go? How do you do it? It's no big deal if you do. It's fine. Just take that break though. Pause. No one's going to think it's with your pause to you will seem like an hour. I stopped. I thought for a moment. I moved on. That feels like every second is like hours to you. To the audience, it's nothing. They're watching you. You're probably going fine. They're not going to mind one bit. Taking a swig of water is not going to seem weird. We do require water to survive. Breathing is good, too. You find you're not breathing. Some people do that. They get so nerve-wracked, they stop breathing as much. You, you stop and breathe. It's healthy to breathe. I recommend it. If you don't breathe for long enough, you may have problems. If you faint and fall off your screen while presenting, uh, people will notice. It will be in your feedback forms later. Uh, he stopped breathing and passed out. Why did they do that? I don't know. <clears throat> but don't do that. Don't be afraid to stop. Stopping is wonderful. There's a lot of summation here, a lot that happens at the end that's important. How do we put all this together? This is huge. Public speaking is a big deal in our lives. This is not some soft skill. A lot of people talk about public speaking as a soft skill, a squishy skill. Not a big deal. If you learn it, great. If you don't, whatever. Who cares? But it's really important. Communication is the basis for everything we do. You can't give ideas to the people. You can't get a job. You can't get an, a promotion. You can't really accomplish anything in life unless you can communicate effectively. And speaking is one of the biggest ways to do it. <clears throat> whether you are at a remote position, whether you're in person, whether you're presenting online, whatever it is, speaking is going to really be critical to doing what it is you do and doing it effectively. If you can't communicate effectively through talking, everything's going to be harder. This is a critical life skill. It's not a squishy soft skill. If you don't do this, it will hurt your life and your not just your career, it will make life harder in general. You know, simple little things you'll notice, like, hey, I'm having a conversation with a person who I love, who's very important to me, and I want to tell them something important. You might have some trouble saying it if you're not good at this. Maybe you want to convince a family member of something important, and you're not sure the best way to do it. Being a little more comfortable at speaking will make that easier, too. Public speaking is not simply getting in front of a crowd and wowing them. It can be talking to your family around the holidays and keeping them from not killing each other. It could be, you know, having a chat about a loved one with a loved one about something important that is really personal and intimate and detailed. If you can do it effectively, your life will be better afterwards. If you totally bomb it and have no way to recover, it may be rough. So this is a skill that impacts every part of our lives. It's really important. It is not something you can just gloss over. Many of us go to school or they get trained and they learn about programming or architecture or web design or whatever and we get to believe hey all I need are tech skills. If I have good tech skills I can do anything and that's never true. You will at some point have to sell something or influence people or share something and when that time comes this will be critical. Can you do this or not? And as a bonus as you get better at speaking you'll get better at lots of other things too. You'll get better at communicating in general because all the rest of the communication skills out there, just body language and feeling for people and sharing emotions and writing get easier. <clears throat> all your other communications look better. You'll become a better writer because you've gotten better at speaking and preparing presentations. Your tech skills will get sharpened because guess what? You will learn from presenting. When you create a presentation on integration services, you will become better at it because you'll be forced to research more and detail more, and the Q&A will test you and force you to get better. And as new things come out, you'll feel obligated to learn them. Because of all this, you'll get better at making decisions. Life is full of decisions. What do I do? Do I take a job or not? Do I introduce myself to somebody or not? Do I go to an event or not? There's a million questions you make you have in your life to answer or not answer, opportunities that come and go and may never come again. You'll get better at them because your speaking will make you better on your toes. You'll know how to deal with things that are difficult. Somebody asks you a super hard question, what do you do? That's a hard situation to be in. And as you get better at that situation, 
you'll get better at other situations that are similar in your life. They may not be speaking, but they'll still involve you having to make a choice quickly and effectively. That's not an easy thing to do ever. But having one method of doing it means you can fall back in it and use these skills to get better at other skills and not make mistakes that otherwise could be made. <clears throat> this will improve your social skills. Uh, we laugh about this. Oh, I have social skills. Everyone loves me. Well, it's not very easy, really. We may think that or not think that. You may be extroverted or introverted. However you are, though, being social with other people and networking and learning from others and having them learn from you isn't easy. It's never easy. Some of us are better at it naturally, and if that's so, awesome. But many of us aren't. Many of us are techies, we're nerds. We think about things as code or Star Trek references or Star Wars or something else like that. Whatever. And it's hard to think in terms of emotions and feelings and how to connect with people. But having one way to communicate effectively means you're better at this as well. And all of this summed together means that your career is going to go better. Whatever career you're in, regardless of where you work, what you do, whether you consult, whether you work for a company or an organization, the state, a politician, whatever, and whatever you do, this will make it all, this will make it easier. You'll be better at what you do because you can speak effectively, communicate effectively, convince people of things. You know, sometimes it sounds like you're trying to sell people, you're trying to sway people and trick them. You're not doing that. This is all about just sharing information. <clears throat> you want to tell somebody, hey, I think we should store this data in Azure, in Comstore Index, in Snowflake, in AWS, in Mariah, in Mongo, in some place, whatever. You're going to convince somebody of something and be, you want to be effective at it. If you're not effective at that, they may make the wrong choice. And you could have had to make the right choice and help them. So think about that as you're trying to make good decisions and help people and being able to communicate better makes it all easier. One last important point about how we can put this all together into a package and, and just, of just what is public speaking is your attendees are here with you. They're not here at you. They're not your antagonists. You're not your villains. You're here with your audience. They want to learn from you and you want to teach to them and help them. They want to help you. Therefore, they're sympathetic. They, they want to like you. They're not here to ruin your life. They're here to help you, especially in a smaller, more intimate setting. If you're presenting to a small group of people that you know, they're going to want to help you. So don't be afraid to let them help you. Don't be afraid to help them and know they're there with you. Don't feel bad and don't bomb it because you made a mistake. <clears throat> they're all here with you. They like you. They want you to succeed. And therefore, you can roll with that. Just remember that. They want you to help you. They want you to succeed. And that's good. So at no point is it you versus them. It's you with them. You're really a team. You, your audience, your moderator, if you have moderators, your moderators, everyone's here with you to accomplish something. So accomplish together. I have actually asked audience members before, hey, do you know the answer to this question? Because somebody asked me something and I knew somebody in the audience would know it. But I just wasn't sure. And lo and behold, somebody did. It's kind of the birthday problem. Who here has the birthday of October 20th? Somebody might if you're in a big enough group. It doesn't take very many, actually. Probability is like one in two once you hit a certain number of people. It's not very many. So the audience can help you. Don't be afraid to lean on them. If you have good moderators that you know are good, maybe they can help you too. Don't be afraid to let them help you out and get involved because, again, you're connecting with them. And that connection is important. So really, this is all a journey. One big journey in public speaking that can really make your life more interesting, more fun, more meaningful, and help others in the process. There are many places you can go. I have some links here. You can't really see links right now because I'm presenting. You can't click on them because it's a video. But I will post this later, and you can have these links and download them. There's many places to get resources. Some resources are tips and tricks, you know, sites to tell you how to be a better public speaker. Some ways are to watch other speakers. There's many, many TED Talks out there, many, many presentations by CEOs and politicians and presidents and people that are very good at what they do. You can learn from them. You know, if you saw a graduation presentation when you graduated from college that was really good, what made it so good? If you saw somebody who gave a presentation at work that was really good, what was good about it? What made it awesome? <clears throat> Think about those things and remember them. <clears throat> you can also use your friends and family, your coworkers. Ask them for help. Don't be afraid to. It doesn't take a lot of bribery to get people that like you to help you. It really doesn't. You may not have to bribe them at all. If you don't want to, but you can. I always appreciate you to bribe, give me a good drink, and I'll be happy. But you know, or pizza, pizza works too. But whatever it is, though, you can lean on friends and family to help, 
and that's wonderful. You can do that, and nobody will ever mind. So use them to help you, and you can use your phone. Phones actually have tools, like PowerPoint has tools now. You can record yourself while you present. You can time your presentation. You can download apps that will record you and then analyze you and give you information back about how you present. This may all be overkill for some people. You may not want this or need this. It may make you feel weird, but these are all tools and ways to get better. And you may have other ways to improve as well. Feel free to do whatever it takes to get better, whether it is record yourself, whether it's ask others for help, whatever it is. There's many, many ways to get better at public speaking and communication in general, and use that to become a better person, become more effective at communication. So use all of this and more. I didn't cover every possible thing there is to cover because we have one hour. And with one hour total, I can't talk forever. Nobody should, nobody can. And you want to stick to your time limit, right? I know for a fact that right now I've been talking for 55 minutes and 42 seconds. No joke. Therefore, I have four minutes left, after which point I'm over and everyone hates me. So we're not going to do that. Therefore, I want to thank you for being here. This is a great event, lots of wonderful sessions by wonderful people. Speaking is a special piece of this, though. This is not a data platform session. This is not about SQL Server, about Azure, or anything else. It's not about SQL or NoSQL or anything else. This is about you, about me. It's about presentation. It's about how to become better at communication. This is something you can do, and in doing so, improve your career and give back to the community. When you present anything to anybody, you can help them. You can improve decision making, you can improve the SQL Server community, or the data community at large. This is a chance to really be out there, to improve everything you do. If you have code you've made, you can now share it. Put it on GitHub, link it, talk about it. You can put your presentations out there too and share them, make them known. If you have a Twitter or some social media you use, LinkedIn, this is your chance to publish all this information and share it and get better while helping others get better as well, whatever it is you present about. This is my info. Feel free to contact me. Uh, Twitter is the great way to get a hold of me, but feel free to get me on LinkedIn or email or whatever else. Find me, whatever is good for you. I'm happy to talk, happy to answer questions, chat about things related to public speaking or other things unrelated to public speaking. But whatever it is you have, feel free to ask it. This is a great topic to learn about, to get better at. And if you've ever spoken before, take the opportunity to try it. Even if it terrifies you, it will terrify you less each time you do it. This is a great way to get better at what we do, at who we are. It will only help you and not hurt you. Even if you have a bad presentation that you feel embarrassed about, you'll come out of it better. I promise you. You'll come out of it better, and you will learn from that experience. So I highly recommend finding an audience you're comfortable with and taking the plunge. Speak to three people, five people, ten people, twenty people, a million people, whatever it is. Do something and try it out and try to feel good about it. It may be awkward. It may be weird to do it for the first time. You'll be so nervous you're going to vomit. Don't vomit, by the way. <clears throat> try to avoid that. That's really awkward. Cut that out. Um, but just do it. You'll feel better every time you do it. It'll be a great experience. So, therefore, I'm going to stop right here and say thank you. Contact me if you want. All the information from this presentation is going to be up online, so you can download it later. Thanks again for having me. Enjoy the rest of the sessions at Data Platform Summit. And if you see anything good, let me know, and I'll talk to you soon. See ya.